Hey, I'm so glad that you're uh, checking things out today. I'm Dan, I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Church, the Norton campus, and love to get to spend this time with you. Uh, first of all, if this is your first time checking things out, email us, let us know. Uh, and if you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to come hang out with us here. Services at eight o'clock, 9.30, 11 o'clock, and also 5.30 in the evening. Uh, love for you to come join us at Easter as well. We're gonna have services together. Love for you to celebrate Easter with us. We'd love to meet you that way. Uh, we have baptism coming up week before Easter. So if you're somebody who said yes to Jesus and you've never taken that step of obedience, I'd encourage you to let us know you're interested in that. And we'd love to talk to you about that. Here's the deal. Some of you are watching this and maybe exploring Jesus. And I just wanna thank you for the privilege and entrusting us with this conversation today. Uh, we're in a series, we're in the middle of a series, and it's a series that is based off of the sermon Jesus preached. Took, takes 20 minutes to uh, read through the sermon called the Sermon on the Mount Jesus preached, and we're gonna take several months to go through it. And we have said this, that uh, the way we approach this is very, very important. That if we approach the Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to uh, go grit it out. People say, I'm going to live by the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I don't know if you ever read it, right? And that leads to some bad places, right? Some uh, legalistic righteousness, some prideful hypocrisy. Uh, but we might leave and say, that's impossible. Like, how could I do that? And someone's going to give it up, right? And this leads to all kinds of bad places. We have said this, that maybe, just maybe the purpose of this isn't that we grit it out or give it up, but that it pushes us to Jesus. That there is this blessed desperation that the response is this humble repentance. That I recognize he's inviting the broken. He's inviting the bankrupt. He's inviting those who are desperate, this blessed desperation. But when I say yes to Jesus, like it, it doesn't stop. There's this humble abiding, right? It's this humble dependence. It's a blessed desperation. It's a blessed dependence. And so we said when we read the Sermon on the Mount that way, it helps us. It affects the way we approach it. Quite frankly, it affects the way we teach it. I heard one pastor put it this way, as I teach this, and I want to say this for me as well, as we teach this, we are not really good people who are telling really bad people how to live. Uh, we are really forgiven people who are pointing all people to the only really good person who ever lived, died and rose again, namely Jesus. Sermon on the Mount points us to Jesus. So that's gonna come in handy because Adam, last week, you didn't get a chance to hear what Adam shared with us. Uh, he taught us last week, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then he invites us into, and we're gonna see this in a week's to come, this deeper understanding in this uh, application of the scriptures. And so next week, uh, Pastor Aiden, Lord willing, is gonna lead us in uh, how that affects our words and our commitments and our oaths. Uh, in two weeks, I wanna talk about anger and fighting and relationships. Easter Sunday, I, oddly enough, maybe we're gonna talk about loving your enemies. But this week, here's the assignment I've been given. Now, the assignment that I've been given to talk about is adultery, uh, lust, sex, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Uh, here's the passage. Just let me show it to you really, really quickly. If you have a Bible, go to Matthew 5, verse 27. Here's what it says. You have heard that it was said, so we're gonna find this kind of a common back and forth. You have heard that it was said, Jesus said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits uh, adultery. Uh, this ought to be easy, right? <laughs> and it ought to be fun. Uh, but I wanna tell you this, there's no way I can cover all of this today. So I wanna cover this today. And then Pastor Adam and I are actually gonna have a podcast and it will be online here for you to check out. We're gonna cover these passages, talk about them together. I wanna warn you about this as well, that I'm gonna talk about some things today uh, that are PG-13, for lack of a better way of putting it. And uh, so if your children are sitting there watching this with you, I don't know, we may talk about some things that may uh, be uncomfortable. I'm not sure. I just want to give you a heads up on that. Uh, here's where I want to go today. I want to talk about uh, the sexual revelation. Kind of want to talk about that. 
I want to talk about the challenge of lust. You saw that in there. Jesus talks about that. The heart of the problem, and then the drastic way out. I think Jesus is going to lead us through that today. Uh, but I'd love to pray. Can we do that as we engage in this uh this journey together today. I think it's very practical, hard stuff we're going to talk about. So God help us, teach us, soften our hearts, I pray, to hear from you. God, with this blessed desperation and blessed dependence, we run into Jesus, uh, even in issues that we're talking about today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One author wrote this, that the most significant revolution in America was not the American uh, Revolution, was not the Industrial Revolution, but it was the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Another author wrote it this way, there is no series of historical events that has impacted every living human being in the Western world and even beyond more than the sexual revolution. Sexual revolution, some of you are aware of this, some of you are like, what is that? It was a social movement that challenged the traditional codes of behavior in regards to sexuality, interpersonal relationships, and it was something that ignited in the 1960s into the 1970s. Sexual liberation, this is straight from uh, Wikipedia, wrote this, included increased acceptance of sex outside of traditional, heterosexual, monogamous relationships, primarily marriage. It included the normalization of public nudity, pornography, premarital sex, homosexuality, masturbation, alternative forms of sexuality, and the legalization of abortion all followed. Uh, some big figures in this would have been influenced by people like Hugh Hefner and Playboy, among many others. Uh, the sexual revolution, some of you know this, of the 1960s gave way to the easy divorcism in the 1970s, which led to the 1980s, the breakdown of the family, which led to the 1990s, this hookup culture, which led to the 2000s, this redefining of sex and sexuality and sexual identity, which led to what we see today, the pornification of society and the commodification of sex in our culture. Here's what I know. That's a lot to start with, right? Here's what I know and here's what you know. Whether you agree, disagree with the statement or the details described, you know this, that the sexual revolution has had great impact in our culture. It's reframed our conversations about sex and sexuality. Uh, it has caused people to reimagine their understanding of their identity. All of a sudden, my identity is driven by my the things that I've done or my proclivity, my desires. It's rewired our mind and recultured a whole generation about sex and sexuality. In fact, there are some of you that that's, all the, that that's the soup you swim in. That's all you know. You've been born since 2000. One pastor said that the sexual revolution gave way to sexual religion. That might be close to being true. Here's, here's the problem, though. Here's the problem. What it promised, it has not delivered. Uh, it just hasn't delivered. Uh, it's fair to say that happiness is not necessarily on the incline, but it's actually on the decline since the 1960s. That Gen Z is the most depressed, anxious, angry, and loneliest generation that we've had. That father, fatherlessness is on the rise. 75% of teens have viewed porn. Over half of them say they stumbled onto it and now are stuck to it. Psychology Today, 2024. Here's the point. The sexual revolution seems to have not led to freedom, but maybe to a bondage of anger, loneliness, parentlessness, and restlessness. Sexual revolution has given way to this idea of cohabitation, which is on the increase, but with it, the increase of likelihood of divorce. Forbes magazine writes in an article just this year, 2024, living together prior to marriage is one predictor of the likelihood of divorce. A total of 57% of couples who did not cohabitate prior to marriage had union lasted 20 or more years compared with 46 who did live together before tying the knot. The Forbes magazine recognizes that this liberation is actually leading to things that it did not promise. Don't take my word for it. We can go to, we don't need to go to the Bible to find out it's not delivering what it promised. Uh, I would call this a bastion of evangelical thought, the Atlantic, said this consent was never enough, that the 
tagline is a generation of Americans have tried a new form of sexual morality and have found, haven't just found it wanting, they found it profoundly harmful. In the article, it goes on to say this, at the core of our cultural moment is the realization that one of the more popular moral trends of the last 60 years, the notion that sex can both be casual and recreational so long as both parties enthusiastically consent, <clears throat> is fundamentally at odds with our human nature and our profound moral needs. April 2022, The Atlantic. Uh, the New York Times, September 2022, dating is broken, going retro, old school, could fix it. The Washington Post says consent is not enough. We need a new sexual ethic. Uh, over here in a B British publication called The Critic, Victoria Smith, a feminist writer and advocate, says the sexual revolution has failed Generation X women. The tagline is more freedom will not cure our disease. And then if I could just point you to this finally, Lu Louise Perry wrote a book, somebody who's a feminist, was an advocate for some of this, wrote a book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, in which she states this, I quote, the task for practically minded feminists then is to deter men from CAD mode. Our current sexual culture does not do that, but it could. In order to change the incentive structure, we need a new technology, a new way of relating that discourages short-termism in male sexual behavior protects the economic interest of mothers and creates a stable environment for the raising of children. And we already have such a technology, even if it's old, clunky, and prone to periodic failure. It's called monogamous marriage, she says in her book. All of this makes me think of a passage in the book of Proverbs. Can I show it to you? You don't need to turn there. Where there is no revelation. A lot of times you hear this quote, where there is no vision, and that's fine, uh, but where there is no revelation, the Hebrew word is actually talking about where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Uh, in the New Living Translation, it says it this way, when people do not accept divine guidance, revelation, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. Uh, you're saying, Dan, what does all this have to do with Sermon on the Mount? I think it's why Jesus begins, you've heard that it was said. He's quoting He's giving us the revelation from God. He's quoting from the Old Testament, and here's what he says right from the Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. Here he's quoting right from the Old Testament, and he's giving us the introduction to not the sexual revolution, but the sexual revelation, that actually God has a word on sex, that God says something about sex and sexuality. He has something to say, and for some of you, that's brand new news. You didn't know that. And I would simply say that where there is no revelation, right, the people perish. For some of you, this is old news. You need to be reminded news, right? God has something to say about sex. It's the sexual revelation. Uh, I'm not going to spend the whole time unfolding everything the Bible says about sex. Can I just make a few comments? I think one of the things we find in Scripture is that God created sex to be enjoyed, celebrated, practiced, inside of the covenant union of marriage between a man and a woman. That's fascinating, isn't it? Uh, I go back to the comment by Louise Perry. We have something, she said, it's called monogamous marriage. When the Bible speaks of God's desire for sex, and when Jesus speaks of sex, it's always in the side of the covenant relationship of marriage. And we're going to talk about marriage in the podcast Pastor Adam and I are doing. I'd encourage you to check it out. But what is a covenant? Well, Tim Keller says it this way. A covenant is far more loving than a simple legal contract, but it's far more binding than simply an emotional attachment. That It's fair to say that for us, maybe the best way to look at it is we have all kinds of relationships. And maybe the best contrast is to contrast a covenant relationship with a consumer relationship. Uh, I was listening to something Tim Keller did, and I got most of this from that talk, uh, that in a consumer relationship, it's my needs are a priority. So I'm going to keep going back to that store, and their job is to meet my needs. And I'll just quit going there, right? Uh, in a covenant, I'll adjust my needs to meet your needs. 
in a consumer relationship, I'm always looking for an upgrade. If that store has it cheaper, if that store has a better brand, if that store, I don't feel like tied to Walmart, <laughs> right? In a covenant, there's a deeper love over time because of the commitment. So the commitment to each other, the promise leads to a deeper expression of love. Uh, a consumer relationship, I go when my needs aren't met. In a covenant, I'm going to stay and keep a promise. In a consumer relationship, uh, there's always the marketing. I, I want you to stay a customer. In the covenant relationship, there's a security because of the promise that leads to an into me see, intimacy. In a consumer relationship, it feels like you're always auditioning. Always auditioning. Uh, in a covenant relationship, uh, Tim Keller says it this way. I love the way he says it, it, that sex is like a sacrament. It's this outward expression of an inward reality. And he says that between a husband and a wife in a covenant relationship, it's almost like a vow renewal ceremony. Fascinating. Uh, C.S. Lewis said it this way, the monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside of marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one union, the sexual union, from all other kinds of union, which are meant to go along with it and make up the total union. In Christ, our attitude doesn't mean that there is anything wrong with sexual pleasure. It means that you mustn't isolate that pleasure and try to get it by itself. And more than you ought to try to get the pleasure of taste without swallowing and digesting. That's what he's saying. Uh, it's fascinating that every time that God speaks of it, Jesus speaks of sex, it's inside the covenant relationship of marriage between a man and a woman. In fact, the marriage that Jesus uh, will point to is the first one, and it reveals to us something as well about the sexual revelation, that sex is a matter of the design of the Creator, not the invention or imagination or maybe the preference of the created. So as the creator, he designed us. To continue to quote C.S. Lewis, he said, why is sexual intercourse outside of marriage wrong? Well, simple, it breaks the design of God, he says. God designed a man and a woman to be a single organism, like a violin and bow or one instrument or a lock and key or one mechanism. Uh, Lewis says, when we isolate sex outside of the marriage union, we're attempting pleasure only in part but not as the whole blessing of God as he designed and intended. So it's always experienced and to be enjoyed inside the covenant union of a husband and wife. And it is a matter of design, not the imagination, invention, and preference of the created, but design of the creator. Which maybe will point us to this, that sex, sexual revelation, according to scripture, is both very good and beautiful. We'll get to that and very powerful, and therefore can be destructive. I, I think, let's start with here, it's very good and beautiful. The Bible is pro-sex. Write that down somewhere. I think a lot of people think of Christians and evangelicals as like anti-sex and prudish when it comes to sex. That's just not the case. It's just not the case, and you would have a hard time reading the Bible and leaving the Bible thinking it's not pro-sex. God's the one who designed sex. Just think about that. He could have created all kinds of ways for us to multiply, to carry out his command to multiply and fill the earth. He chose sex. And the, the, the sexual experience between a husband and a wife to cultivate families, to fill the earth. Right? He could have chose any way, right? But that's what he chose. Now, the Bible is very pro-sex. When you just look at a arc of the Bible, it begins with a naked man standing over a naked woman singing a love song. The Bible is pro-sex. There's all kinds of ways that we see this in the Bible. There's a whole book of the Bible describing in detail the love life of a young couple. Some of you, it would make you blush, my guess would be. The Song of Solomon. Uh, in the scriptures, there is commands and there are instructions like the book of Proverbs chapter 5, may your fountain be blessed, may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe and a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? Somebody like, I've never read the Bible. Maybe you ought to start, right? Uh, the, the Bible is pro-sex. It's very good. It's beautiful. It's to be experienced in this 
this uh, covenant relationship between a husband and a wife, but you need to know the Bible is very real, that it realizes that sex is powerful and can be destructive. It recognizes that sexual sin is sin. Sin is sin is sin. But there's a difference when it comes to sexual sin. I don't need to make the case because you know that. That when it comes to hurt, there's a difference when it's sexual hurt. Uh, some of you have regrets. And for some of you, there's, you, you realize there's a difference when it comes to the sexual regrets. For some of you, there's been betrayal. And you know there's a difference. Maybe it's in your marriage. I don't know when there is a sexual betrayal. There's something different. The best illustration that has been used for years and years and years, and I don't know of a better one, that the sex is both good and beautiful like a fire in my fireplace at home. It creates aesthetics. I can cook on it, get warmth by it. It's good and it's beautiful, aesthetically pleasing. But that same fire that's good and beautiful, right, in that fireplace, uh, in that fire pit, whatever the container, is also very powerful and can be destructive. If I were to take the very same fire out of my fireplace and put it in the middle of my living room floor, it would burn my house down. I think that's the point, and I think maybe that's even what the writer of Proverbs was saying when he was talking about the man who was who was tempted by the adulterer. He said, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothing being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. I think he's saying it's powerful and it can be destructive. You see, the sexual revelation, not only is the sexual revolution contrary to the revelation found in God's word, namely the Bible, but the whole sexual revolution and what it promotes and produces is antithetical to the revelation found in the one who is the word, namely Jesus. Now, just think about this. It's antithetical to the way of Jesus. The sexual revolution was all about self-expression. The sexual revelation and the way of Jesus is all about self-denial. The sexual revolution is all about worshiping sex, but Jesus shows us that it's about worshiping God. The sexual revolution is all about pride, 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 pride. But the way of Jesus is all about humility, 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 humility. Sexual revolution would say, I'm born that way, and the way of Jesus is, you must be born again, John 3. A sexual revolution says, I'm just perfect the way I am. The way of Jesus is, I'm a sinner who needs to be redeemed. The sexual revolution says, it's all about tolerance, 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 and the way of Jesus is all about repentance, repentance, blessed desperation. A sexual revolution says that my proclivities or my desires and my activities, what I've done in the past, determine my identity. So if I have these desires or I've done these activities, that tells me who I am, particularly sexually. It's, that's my sexual identity. And the way of Jesus is that the one who saves me, gives me new birth, determines my identity. And it's my identity in Christ that drives my activity and transforms my proclivities. You see, all this leads to the next part of what Jesus says. Remember, he's quoting the law. Are you still with me? Everybody take a breath. Are you still with me? Remember, Jesus is quoting the law, but he's inviting us to a deeper understanding and application. And so here's what he says. This deeper understanding and this deeper application. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That's the sexual revelation that this beautiful and good thing God created can be powerful and destructive. But he takes us to a deeper understanding and deeper ap application. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is the challenge of lust. Now, I can, I can see right through the, I can see through the lens, through the screen, I can see you, right? because there's several reactions right off the bat, easy to have several reactions to this. Some of you feel this immediate sense of shame and guilt when you read that. Others of you is like, that's, I knew it. Those Christians, right? Prudish, this is impossible. Some will disregard this, like it's just crazy. 
It's not modern. It's not relevant. Others of us will read something like this and it'll drive us into the shadows of a secret life and a secret struggle. And some of you find yourself right, right now, you find yourself in that addiction, in that shadowy secret place. No one else knows about it. You're struggling. So what does he mean here when he says anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her already in his heart? What does it mean to lust? But can we say first what it doesn't mean? Uh, because I think there's some confusion here. I certainly don't think lust uh, means appreciating beauty. I don't think lust is denying, it's, it's not denying that someone's attractive. Um, God created beautiful people. Uh, and so it's recognizing there are beautiful people. There are attractive people. Uh, lust is not the initial look and in recognizing somebody is beautiful, somebody is handsome, somebody is attractive. Um, lust is not, we've already looked at this, cannot be simply talking about sexual impulses. Um, the Bible and God are not anti-sex. Uh, lust is not temptation, but sin. Uh, I like the way Martin Luther said it, you cannot keep birds from flying over your head but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. I like that. He's saying that there, there's something about lust that I recognize that there's a temptation, but the sin is when the bird builds the nest in my hair. So what's he talking about? What's he talking about? Well, let, let's just do a deep dive here for a minute. Blepo, yeah, okay, you can impress your friends. You know a Greek word. That's the word to look, to look at, Here's what it means, to stare, a continuous looking, a glaring. So when he says, anyone who looks, he's saying continuously, this stare, this, this glaring. And then he says lustfully, that's the word epithumeo. And that literally is a desire or lust ever to long after, I would say this is a big deal, covet, set the heart upon. Uh, one person said it this way, to overly desire something for the purpose of satisfying one's own appetites. And so this word is used only a couple times in a sexual context. It's used many times to talk about coveting and kind of in association with greed. So when we put blepo to look at or to stare, continuous glaring, looking, with epithumio, what does it mean? Well, maybe we can get some help here. Let's do that. Lust is talking about when we gaze or stare, blepo, at a woman and objectify her body and use it for our own sexual gratification, epithumio. See what I'm saying? Uh, another commentator, Fowler, said, lust is wrong because you're no longer loving the other person, but using the other person. Lust seeks to master and conquer. Love seeks to serve. It's interesting to me because now, every woman that's watching this right now who has ever been the object of this kind of staring, glaring, or leering look, you know what I mean. Like You're like, I, I know what you mean. It's turning women into objects and dehumanizing them. Uh, Timothy Keller points out this word epithumio can be associated with greed. In fact, it's only used a couple times in reference to this sexual context. But I think this reference to greed and coveting is helpful. Think about greed and coveting. To have money and get fixated on getting more money to the point where getting more money becomes a fantasy that captivates me and feeds an addiction in me that eventually leads to an idolatry in me. I think that's what he's talking about here. Like we got that with money. I need more, 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 and it, it leads to a fantasy. If I had more than this, if I had more than this, if I had more, and uh, many stories of people disappointed in that journey. Some of you might be in that boat, but, but it leads to this fantasy that feeds an addiction. If I have more, I gotta get more, I gotta get more, I gotta get more, I gotta get more. It leads to an idolatry. Everything else surrenders to that, being the thing that captivates my attention, my priority, my passion. We get that with money. I think you apply that to sex and to this idea of objectifying for my own gratification. Can I just take a minute? I think we all know what he's talking about. Like, like we know. 
like us guys watching this, we know it's that delayed stare. It's the second look. It's the pause while scroll scrolling on your phone. It's the decision that you and I make after we recognize the beauty and maybe even feel the sexual impulse. We understand this. Right, here's where the problem lies. Can we just say this just for a few minutes that visual sexual stimulation is everywhere. It's everywhere. You, you, it's just everywhere. You turn on the TV, you go to the beach, you read your news feed, watch a movie, pick up a magazine. Uh, in the doctor's office, it's everywhere. Sex sells. It sells everything from cars to cologne to clothes and everything in between. And there are some obvious ways that we recognize this that some of you are already thinking about. And that's the whole issue of pornography and masturbation. You think about God's design for sex. Sex to be a way to express and give myself to another. Pornography and masturbation doesn't even need another to be present. Our access to it is off the charts with those things that we carry in our pockets. It's led to what is termed a whole new term, the pornification of society. I was reading this recently, uh, this article, more people uh, visit porn sites each month than TikTok, OpenAI, Zoom, Netflix, or Amazon. Uh, this article stated in 2013, there was a very provocative article in the Huffington Post titled, Porn Sites Get More Visitors Each Month Than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter Combined. It shocked the world. 2013, that's 11 years ago. So everyone wondered, with the explosion of online digital platforms, do online porn sites really receive that much more traffic? So a decade later, the authors of a new study published in the journal Sex Research ask a fascinating question to follow up. They said, where does pornography fit into the digital media landscape today? They said this, that not only are the options from 2013 still available, but those options have vastly expanded their offerings. So with far more tele-techno-communicative uh, offerings, there's like things like TikTok, Zoom, ChatGPT, and with people relying on those sites more than ever, does traffic to pornography sites still dominate in the way it did a decade ago? And so their report is from April of 2023. Here's what they found. By comparing the amount of traffic to the three highest globally ranked pornography sites with several prominent digital media properties, it remains, they said, and I quote, true that Americans visit porn sites at an astronomical rate. Using this set of metrics that includes indicators of monthly unique visitors as well as monthly page views, the authors found that the top three pornography sites are more highly ranked than the most well-known household name sites, namely Amazon, Netflix, and Yahoo, as well as those that are the most up-and-coming, TikTok, OpenAI, ChatGPT, and Zoom. They go on to say this, exactly how great is that disparity? In a word, they wrote huge huge. Over 700 million more total visits than Amazon. Over 900 million more visits than TikTok. I could read on and on. Uh, the article goes on to say the porn industry generates almost $100 billion worldwide, more than the NFL, Major League Baseball, and NBA combined. More than ABC, NBC, and CBS combined. You know this. I don't need to make the case, but I will. It affects relationships. People who use it have crushingly unrealistic expectations sexually. Significant number of male users less interested in getting into the messiness of real relationships, which lowers the pool of potential husbands for women. Women, some of you know this firsthand, are being forced to accommodate physical appearance standards that are impossible and destructive, and sexual behaviors that are demeaning and uncomfortable. There's studies, and I don't have time to get into it, that it affects the brain in significant ways. There's one more thing, though, I think is interesting about what Jesus says. Did you see he's addressing who? Primarily men. 
I don't think it's because women don't ever struggle with this, but I do think it's worth noting. I love what one author says, Dr. Tim Mackey, in the history of the human race, which gender has turned sexual desire into a tool for violence, subjugation, and oppression of the other gender? Do we even need to take a vote on that? Jesus is not just teaching individual morality here. He's launching his kingdom. He's inaugurating a new humanity, and he challenges the men who live within his kingdom that if we really want to follow Jesus, we need to allow him to work on this area of our heart so that this place is safe for women. I would say it this way. God doesn't love rules. He loves us, and he's inviting us in. He's inviting us in. Studies show that in the church, 50% of fellows are addicted to pornography, 20% of women. Can we take a breath? Some of you might be saying, I can't believe you're talking about this in church. Well, it seems Jesus had no problem. He preached a sermon and included it. And the fact is, some of us are really, really struggling with this. Some of you are really struggling with this. And sometimes the church, because they never talk about it, it drives you further into the shadows of your struggle, into the secret of your struggle. And some of you have been affected by this. Some of you are, feel broken over this. And Jesus, I think, gives us something very interesting. He says this, that the sexual revelation, the challenge of lust needs to lead us to the heart of the problem. Because he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her. Say those words out loud in his heart. At the heart of the problem is a problem of my heart. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said it this way, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, classes, political parties, but right through every human, what? Heart. And through all human, what? Hearts. I love this quote, St. Methodus of Olympus. It's not the fruit of adultery that he commands us to cast out, but it's seed. And the seed is in the heart. And those seeds are in all of us. Can I just say that? Like they're in all of us. You're not alone. Those of you who are out there and you're just struggling with the weight of shame of this, you're not alone. Those of you who are saying, man, this doesn't apply to me, you're fooling yourself. The seeds are in all of us. It's not the lustful looking that causes the sin in the heart, but it is the sin in the heart that causes the lustful learning, pastor and commentator John MacArthur says, and I agree. I think the point is this, that if the heart of the problem is a problem of the heart, then the solution to the problem must be a solution to my heart. Guys, this is why religion will not work. I heard a friend of mine, Pastor Tony Levigny, say it this way, religion is like mowing your weeds. You ever mow? You ever mow your weeds? What happens? Next week, guess what? The weeds grow back. I remember my mama, she's teaching me, uh, Dan, you got to pull up the weeds and you got to make sure you get the root. You see, the root of the problem isn't behavior modification, isn't religious rigor, but what it is is a problem of the heart. That's what Jesus is pointing to. The decision I make with my eyes reveals what's happening inside my heart. It reveals instead of loving people, I am using people. The primary reason you exist is for my gratification, for my purposes. And so if the problem is a heart problem, what does it mean? Well, it means I need a new heart. That's why I come to Jesus. It's blessed desperation. Ephesians Chapter 4 says, put off the old self, which belongs to your former way of life and is corrupt, and be renewed in your spirit of minds. Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5 says that in Christ we are new creations. I need a new heart. I need to come to Jesus, the one who lived this perfectly and yet died for all of us who can't and haven't, and humbly repent and ask for his forgiveness surrender my life to him as Savior and Lord. I need a new heart. Uh, Beyond that, I need a healed heart. Some of us just feel broken over all this. 
Some of us just feel damaged over all this. I love Psalm 147, verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. That in Christ there's healing. You don't need to hide in the shadows. You won't heal in the shadows. I need a new heart. I need a healed heart. I need a, how about this, a renewed heart. That when I come to Christ, I continue to just come to him with my heart, my mind. Paul said it this way, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of all that God's done for you, give your bodies as living sacrifice. They're yours, holy and pleasing, set apart. This is what worship really is. And he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, right? But be transformed, a transforming heart by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing. Like I'm gonna come to Jesus and renew my mind. Something is renewing my mind. It's either culture or it's Jesus. And as he does that, he's gonna transform my heart. And then, then I, I just think this, I, I need a new heart, I need a healed heart, I need a renewed heart, I need to guard my heart. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it, which is why I think Jesus says this, and here's where we'll kind of come to a close. You shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So then Jesus says this. It's like, can we just read this? If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to... Lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It's like, what does this mean? Like, like you're saying, Dan, should we take this literally? Here's the deal. I think if we were to take this literally, it'd be a, one, a lot of one-eyed, one-handed guys running around, right? I also think that if he meant it literally, that there's other obvious body parts he could have referred to. John Stott says it this way. This is not talking about physical self-mutilation. But what he's talking about here is ruthless self-denial. I worded it this way at the outset. This is the drastic way out. Jesus is proposing a drastic way out. Stott in his commentary says, eliminating certain things from our lives that either are or could become a source of temptation. It's foregoing some experiences this life offers in order to enter the life that lets life indeed. Uh, maybe we could rewrite it this way. Jesus could say, better to have a flip phone in an iPhone world than to fill in the blank. Better not to have cable in a cable world. Better not to live stream in a, better not to, or maybe he would say it this way, better to have your spouse have all your internet passwords than to, better to miss the movie everyone's raving about than to, I think what he's saying is guard your heart. Why does he say that? This is interesting to me. Because when the Bible talks about temptations that come from Satan, it, it, it encourages us to do several things. It's like put on the armor of God and take your stand and resist Satan. Uh, when, when the Bible talks about it, it says, it says, resist Satan and he will flee from you. But when it comes to sexual temptation, there is a change of tone. Look at what it says. Can you read this out loud with me? Flee from sexual immorality. Flee. Don't stand and try to flee. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, God, honor God with your bodies. He says, I want you to flee. First Thessalonians, he says it this way. I want you, it's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Learn to control your body in a way that's holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. See, here, here's, here's the deal. The question is, what do I need to amputate or cut away from my life to guard my heart? And I think what Jesus is saying, do it. What do I need to flee from? I think Jesus is saying, run from it. Who, who or what do I need to avoid? I think Jesus is saying, avoid it. Avoid them. So let's take a breath. 
for those of you who are watching this and you're my brothers, you're followers of Christ, you've said yes to Jesus, we are not exempt from this. Statistics say 50% of us are addicted to pornography. And, and I just wanna say several things to us. First, as brothers in Christ, we have a responsibility to our sisters and women in general to love them and serve them, not objectify them for our own purposes. But beyond that, we have a responsibility to each other. Like, why isn't this talked about more when there are so many people struggling about it? I honestly don't believe some of you are in the shadows that you will heal in the secret. That you need to find some brothers that you can share this with, that can walk with you. James 5 says this, it's just interesting to me, confess your sins to one another and there you'll find healing. And I think, what is he saying? I heard one author say it this way, that we've replaced the confession of sin with counselors. I don't know that I totally, but counselors are great. But I think what he's saying is sometimes I just need to say it and realize that I'm not the only one struggling with it, but I need somebody else to know I'm struggling with it. And so some of you are followers of Christ and, and you're threatened to go deeper into the shadows. You'll never heal. You'll never heal. To sisters, you have a responsibility as well, sisters in Christ. Some of you are struggling as well with 20% of those who are followers of Christ that are women are struggling, addicted to pornography, statistics say. And I, I want to say you won't tackle this on your own. And you're like, well, this isn't talked about. And we didn't talk about it tons. I understand. But I've met women who struggle with pornography. And, and what they're doing is they're trying to fill. It could be images. It could be novels. It could be whatever. They're trying to fill something that's empty that it's not going to fill. And you have a responsibility to each other as sisters. Responsibility not to do things or promote your body in ways that are going to create, cultivate insecurities in each other. And I think you have a responsibility to other brothers in Christ and even men in that regard as well. There are some of you watching this that are sexually broken and struggling and I just want you to know there's hope and there's healing in Christ. In Christ, you are not your past decisions. You are not your biggest regrets. You are not your addictions, hang-ups, and struggles. And the biggest thing that happened to you doesn't need to be that decision, doesn't need to be that hurt, but it can be the fact that the God of the universe came in the person of Jesus and died in your place. And now in Christ, you can be a new creation trophy of grace, a masterpiece in the Father's hand, and a child at his table. And I'm not naive that there's some of you exploring Jesus, and I want you to know this, that he loves you, and he invites you into a new relationship with him. You see, God doesn't love rules. He loves us. And, and these things are not prison bars. They're railroad tracks to a life that Jesus invites us into, an eternal life for sure, an abundant life. The Sermon on the Mount is he's the right side up king who comes to an upside down world and offers this better vision for your life. God help us to embrace a lot that we've taken in and my friends watching this are struggling in different ways. And I pray that you'd meet them in that space and help them to walk God in a way that would lead to a blessed desperation pushed right into Jesus a blessed dependence that leans right into Jesus, a blessed desperation that cries to you to save us, a blessed abiding that says we need you to lead us. I love you. Thank you for loving me. I pray this in Jesus' name.